Hello, and welcome again to Emerge Financial Health. I'm Lynette Kalfani Cox, the Money Coach. It's my pleasure to serve as today's keynote on addressing racial wealth gaps. It's quite fitting that the theme for this year's Emerge Financial Health event is about a year of change and looking at what's happened, but also keeping a solid forecast on the future and what we can all do in terms of solutions. I think no one will deny that this past year has definitely been one of massive transformation and change throughout American society. Certainly, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has really laid bare a lot of inequities in our society. Not only did the pandemic highlight those differences, but it also exacerbated a lot of inequities in many ways. Social justice inequities, healthcare inequities, educational inequities, and then of course, economic inequities. And we know that financial health actually underpins all of those other areas. So these forms of inequality though are not new. We know that they've existed and have been around for decades and actually generations. We've seen gaps in unemployment rates, for example, where the rate for black households is typically twice as high as that of white households. That's been a trend in place again for decades. Right now, the home ownership gap is at its highest level in 60 years. It's at a 30 percentage point difference. And then there's the wealth gap, of course, where the typical white household has about eight times as much wealth as do black households. So how did we get here? Well, certainly there have been various forms of racism, structural inequality, systemic barriers that African-Americans have faced, redlining, fewer access to financial services and products in communities of color, but even things beyond that, what some might call soft forms of racism, things like microaggressions in the workplace, or maybe even a failure to get a call back at all for a job because of an ethnic sounding name. Now, some of you might be saying, well, why should I care? That really doesn't affect me. Well, I wanna give you a little bit of insight into why we should all care. Certainly from a financial perspective, all of us have a vested interest in this and should want to close the racial wealth gap. McKinsey data has shown that if we were to close the black white wealth gap by 2028, we could boost GDP by as much as 6%. That would amount to as much as $1.5 trillion in additional stimulus for the economy. You talk about a jolt in the arm. That stimulus would come by way of added consumption, additional investment, and so on. McKinsey data has also shown in a separate study from McKinsey that if we were to have greater full participation of the African-American community in terms of financial services, access to products, credit, loans, and that kind of thing, the benefit to the financial services industry would be huge, $60 billion in added revenue per year. That's a reason to care. Now, some of you might be thinking about, well, what can be done? I'm going to try to direct your efforts on what I'm calling the three P's, policies, practices, and privilege. From a policy standpoint, I really do think it's incumbent upon all of us throughout the industry to look at the internal policies of our organizations and the external policies that we might advocate and support that actually impinge upon or help in some way black wealth. Case in point, Right now, there's a lot of talk about student loan debt and about the prospect of student loan debt forgiveness. Controversial in some circles, but I can tell you this, for so many black professionals who have undergraduate or advanced degrees, graduate degrees, et cetera, a lot of them also carry student loan debt. So a policy like loan forgiveness would actually be very helpful for the black community from a net worth standpoint. And what about those practices? The idea here is that from top to bottom, organizations should be thinking about whether or not their policies are definitively, proactively, and assertively anti-racist. In many times, some organizations might not be aware or might not be um, privy to the way in which 
Certain policies can have a disproportionate impact, a negative one, on the black community. In other words, it might have outcomes or unintended impacts. So you need to take a look at that. And then from a standpoint of privilege, I also call upon my white friends and colleagues often to be that advocate, to be that ally in the room. When you see, for example, that one black person who's the sole black professional, invite that person into the conversation, elevate that person, amplify his or her ideas, maybe raise that person's name for uh, a job promotion for the qualified candidate or in some circles where you know that they might uh, benefit from having a mentor or a key relationship. You can be an advocate, you can be an ally in every single way that uses your privilege. Now, from a standpoint of organizational action, you can also better engage with the organizations on the ground in the black community. And in particular, I'm thinking about the ways in which you can be far more collaborative with nonprofit organizations and community-based groups. Now, the financial services industry I found is quite good at collaborating with itself, with one another. Here's an example. This coming fall, starting in September, a group of 10 banks and financial services institutions are gonna get together and collaborate and share data for an initiative to provide credit cards to the unbanked or the underbanked. So people who wouldn't have a traditional credit score, how is this being done? Well, you're going to give information back and forth between institutions about those consumers' other financial behaviors, whether or not they don't bounce checks, how much they keep on savings or checking account deposit, that kind of information. I think it's a great innovation and it's likely to be something wildly successful and popular. But imagine if you were to use that same level of innovation on the ground with community-based organizations that are close to the communities you'd like to serve or do business in. Those organizations can provide you with untold levels of access, with additional insights, with reams of data about the community that you wouldn't otherwise get on your own. Now, you also need to be willing to take a look in the mirror and to say what more can be done internally in terms of our own shops. We know right now that African Americans comprise only 7% of the financial services industry, despite being about 14% of the population. You know, some people might say that that's not so bad and we're making progress. Well, I have to argue with you because there's not been any progress because 15 years ago, in 2006, the EEOC did a study on diversity in the finance industry. And guess what they found? It was 7% African American back then. So we're at the same exact levels. I think that's unacceptable. And I know we can do better. So on the action front, what can be done? All of us need to be thinking about employment and employing a strategy that is much more cohesive for African-American talent. I think you need to look at rethinking, rewriting, and revamping your overall HR strategy from top to bottom. And by this, I mean you need to look at retention, hiring, recruitment, of course, promotion, mentoring. You need to think about the ways in which you're nurturing black talent all along the way, especially because the numbers are so low. I know some of you say, well, we lose good people. They go elsewhere or we can't find anybody. We've got a pipeline problem. Well, most black professionals like myself would beg to differ. We don't think that there's a pipeline problem to the extent that there's a lack of black talent. We think the problem is more that your pipes are rusty or maybe some of you don't have pipes at all. You don't have the infrastructure to hold the talent to keep black professionals happy, fulfilled and rewarded throughout their career to want to stay within your organization or within the industry. That's a challenge that needs to be addressed. One of the ways you can start to get much better results though, is to start tying compensation at the executive level and beyond to some of the outcomes that you'd hope to reach. When we start tying pay to performance, when, as it pertains to things like inclusion and diversity and equity, 
we definitely will start to see that we're moving the needle on those fronts. Now, we all know also that if it doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. So I'm also going to call upon you from an action standpoint to really think about making this a business imperative to measure, to track and reward the outcomes that you would like to see. Now, some of you might be saying, well, this sounds like an awful lot, Lynette. And some of you might be right about that. Maybe it's a lot, but you know what? You've got a lot of work to do. You've got a lot of catch up to do. You've got a lot of opportunity also. So I hope that you'll take away from this brief time that we've had today, some insights that I've shared here with you and the promise for what could be a more inclusive financial environment for all. I don't care whether you work for a bank or a credit union, a FinTech firm, an insurance company, or some other financial services industry. We all can be doing things to address the racial wealth gap in 2021 and beyond. Thank you again for listening and enjoy the rest of Emerge Financial Health.